Lord, I want to be near you. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to be in your intimate mercy. Lord, I want to be like you. No one can be I'm going to tell you a little secret that I've never told anybody. When God wants me to pay attention to something, I can physically feel him do this. He's done that twice this, this morning. People I know you've been keeping up with what's going on in Ashbury and Lee and different places. I'm excited about what's going on right here. We're on the threshold. Believe me, I'm telling you, something's about to break in this church. Something's about to break in the Tri-County area. It's not just us, okay? People everywhere. We are in the last days. We are entering into the latter rain. We are entering into an end time harvest. I have given you three words, power, wonder, and overflow. And never have I ever felt stronger about those three words than I have this week. Power, wonders, and overflow. My message this morning, I don't know if you're ready for this, but you can try. The Jesus freaks are back. <laughs> Some of us came out of that generation and I was one of them. I was stuck between two groups at that time. I was into the ministry. And the Brownville revival at that time was uh, taking place when I mentioned, I shared the books down here uh, on a Wednesday night. John Osteen, Joel Osteen's dad, received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and became one of the first Bapticostals. And he, we were working together and he was giving out his books and everything. He gave me one of his books, autographed it for me. But we saw the same thing there at Brownville and Pensacola that we saw and that we were seeing in Ashbury. Ashbury at that time had the same thing going on there that was happening all over the country. And so I needed to very carefully walk my way through my message this morning because I believe that we are on the threshold of a spiritual breakthrough like we have not seen in the last 70 years. Uh, I do want you to be aware of this. People, even religious leaders, will find fault. The media may praise it on one side and criticize it on the other side. And when they started saying Jesus freaks back then, that was a put down. But the young people wore it as a banner of pride. And they would tell you real quick, yes, I'm one of those Jesus freaks. And I want you to understand they're coming back. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. Um, our nation, our churches, stand in need of a God-sent revival. And I say God sent, not man made. When the Brownsville revival in the 90s took place, of course, my wife and I are here in Texas at that time. We did visit several times. It was unique. The Brownsville church has had three revivals in its history. One reached the city, 
The second one reached the nation, and the third one reached the world. The people involved were not perfect people, but people who made themselves available to God. And that's what God is looking for. If you're waiting to become perfect, forget it. There was only one perfect. His name is Jesus. In Christ Jesus, in Christ the anointed one with the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage, in Christ Jesus, the Redeemer who shall save his people from their sin, I want you to know something. God can use every one of us. You say, well, I have this hang up, I have that hang up. If you make yourself available to God, God will use you for his glory. Okay? The pastor, a very good friend of mine that pastors over in the Dallas area back then, told me what he wanted to do, and he invited me to come to the service. My wife and I went. But he wanted to mimic the Brownville Revival. And so what he did, he brought in a bunch of name-brand preachers. He brought in professional Christian artists, singers, what have you. In other words, he was trying to make what happened at Brownville happen in his church. And it was a total fiasco. It was downright embarrassing, and it was a flop to the point that the next service was absolutely canceled. Now here's what I want you to understand. There would be colleges and campuses trying to mimic. If it's God, we don't have to mimic a thing. Do not get caught up in that. Expect it to happen because it will. And just as there would be people that would say, this is not of God, there would be those who would say, and it may, you may think it's not of God, but let me tell you what God done for me. And you will find God doing all kinds of things to all kinds of people. And one of the things that you're going to find God doing is for people who you think need to get saved. I was working with Oral Roberts in a tent revival, and there was a prostitute, uh, pardon me, there was a stripper that uh, had been involved in a car wreck. And she had three kids at home. She was uh, a divorcee, and she had to support the kids, and that was the only way she knew to earn a living to support the kids and pay the bills was to work in a strip club. And the car wreck took her out of the strip club. Somebody brought her to the tent meeting that night, and Oral Roberts prayed for her, and God healed her instantly to the point that she started running back and forth. Whereas she had to be helped in to the building, to the tent. She's running back and forth across the front now. Oral Roberts called her back up and talked to her a little bit. And one of the questions he asked her, he said, what do you plan on doing now? She said, going back to work so I can take care of my kids. And I'm thinking, not to the strip club. And do you know, I expected him to correct her, chastise her, tell her you can't do that. Or this. He didn't. He said, I'm going to pray for you to never have a financial worry again. He never condemned her. He never passed judgment on her. You could hear the people in the audience going, huh, when she said that she was going back to work. She didn't have to go back to the strip club. In fact, she found a very good paying job right there in the Brownville area of Pensacola. I got to see her frequently after that, and she did very well. Do not underestimate what God can do with you or through you or for you, regardless of what kind of a past you have. Okay? Are you listening to me? Yes. Tell me you're listening, all right? Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, now, the other thing I want to mention is if there ever was a time for us to have godly parents and godly leaders, we need that right now all across the land to build godly families so we can have godly churches, Christ-centered churches. And the, we are living in, in a, an era where uh, we have been metro, metroized, that means, I'm not saying that word right, but it means captured, caught in what we would call cultural paganism. I go to a restaurant and I sit down and order my food and I look around the room and everybody in that restaurant is on their cell phone. You get a bunch of kids together and they're sitting there talking to each other on their cell phone. 
we have what we have now is a cultural paganism. They will fight you for that phone. If you really want to get them upset, take the phone away from them. Put them on restriction. Say something. You can't have your phone for a whole month. They will divorce you. They will threaten you. They will run to their room and slam the door. But I'm talking to you, folk. We need to get God back in the center of everything that we're doing. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the whole idea of the Jesus freaks are back is what I want to focus on this morning. And this is the thing I want you to see. A real point one would be a true move of God will turn the hearts of the people. A true move of God will turn the hearts of the people. And I like the uh, song that the, uh, the praise team was singing this morning, Fire, Fall Down, Fire, Fall Down. And I invite your attention to look with me, if you will, at First King chapter 18, a very, very familiar passage of Scripture, and I want you to see the power of it. And so we're looking in First King chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. This is Elijah standing before the prophets of Baal. Ahab and Jezebel are the ones that's running the country, and they have led the whole nation of Israel into idolatry. And in verse 21, Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you halter? How long will you limp? How long will you falter between two thoughts or two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. The word Baal means materialism or possessions. And we're living in a Baal society right now. Everything is about stuff. I need more money, I need more food, I need more groceries, I need another piece of equipment. It's all about how much money can I get to take care of stuff. And money, and, and Jesus talked about the fact you'll worship either God, you'll worship money. The word mammon is an old English word for money. So what does our society today worship? You go to work five, six days a week. You work eight to ten hours a day. And it's hard to find time to go to church on Sunday. We have turned everything around and got everything going in the wrong direction. God is about to change that. And what I'm... It's very hard for me to do this. But I see a hurting people out there. They're hurting. And they don't know the answer. And I get accused of being the preacher. Every one of us are preachers. Amen? Yes. How many of you are preachers? I'm, come on now, we're all preachers. Our proclaimers of the doctrine. All right. <clears throat> oh boy. And so this is what Elijah was facing. He felt all alone in this situation. He said, look, if God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. Now which one is God? The one you're serving right now is your God. Okay? And so he goes on and says this. In verse 22 he says, I'm all alone. In verse 23, he gives them a proposal about a sacrifice with two bulls, putting no fire under it, getting everything ready. In verse 24, he says, Call upon the name of your gods, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, and the God who answered by fire, fire fall now, fire fall down, fire fall down, answered by fire, he is God. And all the people said, It is well spoken. I shared this last Sunday, and I, I haven't been able to get away from it all week. But when the fire department showed up at my church in Florida and told me the building was on fire, I'm inside, and I had to agree it was on fire. The people were all over the place on fire. But they were seeing flames that burned the building on the outside, but when you looked at the flames, the, the flames weren't touching the building. But the building was crowned with fire. That same night, it happened in five other churches across this nation. One of them was in Kentucky. You want to go figure out which one? Okay. But the whole deal, it happened in five different locations, and everybody made a phenomenon out of it, and the media shut it down immediately as sensationalism, somebody playing tricks and games. I want you to know something. And Elijah prayed a prayer 64 words long. And in 64 words, he brought fire down from heaven. 
I want you to look with me. Verse 30. Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. He repaired the altar, repaired the altar, repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. He took twelve stones according to the tribe to the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name, peace shall be your name. He built this altar, verse 33, he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood, and then he said, fill four water pots with, uh, four water, pots with water that's about 120 gallons of water he poured on that altar. And he said, do it again, and they did it again. He said, do it again. They did it the third time. Three times they poured 120 gallons of water on the wood, on the sacrifice. He had dug a ditch all the way around it, and the water is in the ditch. Verse 35, the water ran all around the altar. He also filled the ditch or the trench with water. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are the God of Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again, and that my first point, a true, real move of God, will turn the hearts of the people." And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stone, the dust, and licked up all the water that was in the ditch. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Amen. People, I want to tell you something. We don't have to come in here and prime the pump and pump you guys up and get you all excited and get you shouting all over the place through emotionalism. All we've got to do is present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable act of worship. Yes. Yes. And I'll come back to that word, worship. Hallelujah. I believe with all of my heart that I'm not the only one in the room God doing this to. Amen. Amen. I want to mention this also. Young people, the youth are searching for reality, for truth, for what's real. They're searching for God. The Jesus movement that birthed the phrase, Jesus freak, actually started in the late 60s on the West Coast. Chuck Smith, pastor of a Church of Christ, had a breakthrough in his service like you see going on in Asbury right now. It was all young people. Chuck Smith realized at that moment he was not in charge and had sense enough to let God take over. I've been telling you for two years that this revival that's breaking out right now would be with Grassroot people, not big name evangelists and pastors. And it would be the younger generation that has not seen a move of God, have never seen signs, wonders, and miracles. They're looking for the real thing. And folk, God knows how to get our attention, and God is going to make it happen. That started in the late 60s. It moved from the West Coast to the East Coast. It swept through Brownville and Ashbury as it moved across the land. We were all getting caught up in it. And I want you to understand that it became an issue with traditionalists. Those old timers, you know, those old people in the church, how many of you know those old people in the church are a problem? I'm trying my best to be one. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it lighthearted too. But the whole deal was this. You had I'm from Pensacola, Pensacola Beach, okay? This started on the West Coast, California, and those are beach people too. And so you had all the people grabbing their surfboard, and you got a Bible in one hand and a surfboard in the other hand. Some of you remember all of this, okay? And then what happened in the church was you had, like on Sunday night, the pastor would say, if anybody wants to sing in the choir, come up and join us. They left the choir robes in the choir room, you know, that on Sunday night. 
And so you've got all your traditionalists, uh, how, great they are, how great thou art, and amazing grace people, going to the platform, that's the regular choir. Then you had all these people off the beach coming up and uh, in their mm, beach clothes, you know, uh, long-haired hippies, all this kind of stuff. And they're up there, and, uh, you know, the traditional people, nice and hand-folded and everything, Amazing Grace has half mass. You know, have you ever noticed traditional people, they praise the Lord like this? Half mass. The only time you fly half mass is when somebody's dead. I had one fellow tell me, he said, but that's the best I can do. I've got a problem with my shoulder. I can't lift it any higher than that. I used to be able to do this, but I can't do that anymore. Thank you, you got it, okay. <laughs> Hallelujah, okay, oh brother. But the whole deal was, you saw this movement across the land, and it was really messing up the traditional churches. And we had people leave the Brownville church to go down the road to another church, non-Pentecostal church if that matter, because they couldn't handle the transition that was taking place. And what we did, we started a couple of churches over on the beach that are still going today. In fact, my wife's uh, sister is a member of one of the churches that we started way back there in the Jesus Freak movement. I'm telling you, God is about to do a repeat in a bigger way than ever before. What we have seen historically is small from 2,000 years ago until now is small stuff compared to what we are about to see. And somebody said, well, what, what do we do with the wildfire? Let her burn. Yes. Yes. Let the wildfire burn. I'll tell you what. I, I heard somebody talking to me just the other day about the wildfires out in California. I, don't, I had never heard this. But you've got this crew that goes in trying to put the fires out. But there is another crew, a nonprofit organization that's coming right behind the guys that are trying to put out the wildfire and replanting for growth season in the spring so all that has been destroyed can be replaced. Folk, I want you to know we got some people here that's going behind the wildfire and planting new souls into the kingdom of God and we're going to see a mighty, mighty restoration of that which has been destroyed in what is called the body of Christ. One of the other things that the Jesus movement did was it introduced contemporary Christian music. We're still struggling with that. I have a pastor friend here in town who preaches in a contemporary service and a traditional service. He preaches one service just as fast as he can preach it, and when as soon as he finishes with that, he runs over to the other congregation and preaches to the, other, the same message to the other congregation. The message is the same. The music's different. You got contemporary Christian music. You know, people like Barry McGuire and Keith Green, anybody remember those names? Yeah. They were some of the people that started that contemporary Christian music. They didn't change their, their music style. They just change the lyrics. And so after a while, you've got them up there boogieing, trying to be the Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee Lewis of the full gospel churches. I really got upset on one of our trips to Mexico. We were doing a mission trip, and a group from California came down, and they had a praise and worship team too, and they began to sing Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Beverly Shea singing for Billy Graham. And these kids came in like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. They saved a wrench like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see it's the real thing. They put two things together, a Coca-Cola commercial and the theme song from it's The House of the Rising Sun, which was about prostitution. I am freaking out.
And you know what I did when I came to this church? I, led, I had two praise and worship services. Traditional. And contemporary. It was so much fun. The people that started this church came from fundamental churches, but not Pentecostal. And because of uh, full gospel businessmen fellowship and women the God women the globe, they began to get the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but they didn't know what to do. And so what they, they were singing out of the hymn books. How many of you have never sung out of a hymn book? How many of you know what a hymn book is? That's what's wrong with this church. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Oh boy, but they were singing out of the hymn book, you had the piano and the organ going, have, and I like organ, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm going to get this one fixed. Kids moved it from that side of the room to this side of the room and tore it up and moving because they didn't know what they were doing. So we'll get it fixed and Bruce can play it. He's just smiling at me, all right. But we would go through the hymn book and, sing, you know, you sing three songs, first, second, and last verse. And then they'd get out of the way. And I brought Johnny Huckel up to the microphone, and he and I started singing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Never mind, you know. <laughs> but we, we, we had, uh, and it, got, it was a struggle from, from day one. It's still a struggle. Back then, there was only two generations you had to fight with. Today, there's three generations out there to fight with. And I'm going to tell you something. If you go to country western music, I'm going to put a tin out back and have nothing to do with it, okay? <laughs> but move, <laughs> moving right along. Uh, Billy Graham uh, said this uh, more than once. And by the way, during that time, Billy Graham is supposed to have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He never made that a big theme in his ministry or anything, but those behind the scenes know what was pretty much what was going on. Billy Graham received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, was speaking in tongues. But he never made that a point. But what he did do was he said, they asked him what, they, what he thought of the Jesus movement. The Jesus speaks. He said, if the church will not mess with it and leave it alone, it will grow and it will be the best thing that ever happened to this country. But if church leaders try to take it and control it, it will die. And guess what? Church leaders tried to tell these kids, this is not the way you do it. You're supposed to do it just like me. I have to tell you something. There is no one set way to get people born again. There is no one set way to get people healed. There is no one set way to get people baptized in the Holy Spirit. But there is only one Jesus and one gospel. Stick to the Word of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. There is a group of people, Christians, that are producing movies. They're called The Producers. And in fact, they made a movie in 2018 with the theme song, I Can Only Imagine. They have finished their latest movie. It will be released this week, somewhere between the 22nd and the 24th. The name of that movie is The Jesus Revolution. It is based off of this revival in Ashbury in 1970. Here's what the producers said weeks ago before the movie was really, hasn't been released, it will be released this week, they finished the movie. Here's what the producers said before Ashbury happened. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this movie caused another Ashbury revival? <laughs> Let me tell you something. The movie's not out, and the Ashbury Revival is already going. It's spreading like wildfire. This movie is going to hit next week all over the nation. Folks, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. But trust me, it's going to happen. The Jesus freaks are back. Yo! Thank you, Jesus. My second point. 
Repentance and worship creates a spiritual awakening. Now, I want to tell you what I have to say about repentance. In fact, if you look with me in your Bibles, it's Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14 and 15. Is a very familiar passage of scripture. Solomon had just finished dedicating the temple. I almost wanted to go in my office and get my piece of marble from Solomon's temple and bring it in here and just put it in my pocket for anointing. Second Chronicles chapter seven, verses fourteen and fifteen. Solomon had dedicated the temple. When the priests came out to do the temple dedication, 120 of them, they stepped out on the porch. The power of God fell. The fire of God fell. Fire fall down. Fire fall down. Fire fall down. And 120 of them fell on the floor. They didn't move until God got finished with his business. Folk, People falling on the floor doesn't bother me. People running around the building doesn't bother me. People hooping and hollering doesn't bother me. I'm serious. We've seen so little of it in the Pentecostal churches in the last 40 years that everybody thinks that person is weird. That same person can be at a football game and do the same thing and they think that's normal. But we've got everything messed up right now. God's about to put it back together. Trust me. He's about to put it back together. My people, if, if my people, since my people, when my people, that word if in the original can be translated if, when, and since. Since my people who are called by my name will humble themselves in prayer and seek my face. Since, if my people which are called by my name, when my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their carnality, their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their land, for, pardon me, forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, everybody say now. Now, and I'm talking about right now. Now, God says, my eyes will be open, my ears attentive to the prayer made in this place. For I have now... For now I have chosen, now, 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 for now I have chosen and sanctif sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. I know when I'm doing what God wants. <laughs> Mm -mm. I'm hearing this. I heard this in the Brownville Revival in the 70s. I'm hearing it again. If you want revival, you have to repent. I agree. But our definition of repentance needs to change. How many of you have asked God to forgive you for your sins? I understand the concept we need to repent daily, but I want you to understand that does not mean that we are sinning every day and we've got to repent every day. Repentance means turn around and go the other way. And you're going to hear me say that again and again because already I'm hearing people say we need to repent and if we've got anything in our past, in fact, somebody was sharing a testimony with me from Ashbury where one individual, God spoke to him, told him to go forgive somebody. In the context of that uh, time they were spending with God, God said, if you've offended anybody else, to go take care of that. You know, I understand that. But what happened was, after they had uh, talked to the 34th person, 
is when God became real to them, what was happening, it wasn't the fact that they were confessing to 34 people how they had offended them or needed to forgive them or whatever the situation was. It was all of a sudden the light bulb came on and they understood. That's the way I used to be. I'm not like that anymore. This is the way I am now. I used to be in darkness, but now I'm walking in the light. I used to be a child of the devil, but now I'm a child of the king. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world and turned right around and said, we are the light of the world. Folks, we need to repent we need to stop walking in the wrong direction and start walking in the right direction if my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their carnality turn from their wicked ways I will hear from heaven my eyes will be on this place and he's talking about Solomon temple a building there but he's also talking about the fact that there's going to come a day when it's not a physical building that the Lord is in it's a people we are the temple of the most high God and God said my eyes is on you now and today now right now is the time for you to have your victory. It's time for a revival, a restoration, a renewal. When? Not next week. Not when Ashbury has sent it our way. But when it gets right here in me right now. I am ready. Hallelujah! Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I've been preaching for several weeks from Hosea chapter 6, verse 1, 2, and 3. Because it's talking about the latter rain. But the other sermon that I preached from that is the fact that the four spirits of revival is there. And the first one that's in that first verse is repent. In other words, turn around and go the other way. Stop doing what's not working and start doing what is working. If your prayer life isn't working, change the way you're praying. If your ministry is not growing, change the way you're ministering. A lot of pastors, in fact, most pastors last 36 months in their present congregation and they move on. Some denominations move their pastor every three years because they know that when, that's about how long they're going to last. I want you to understand something. The beginning of a marriage, a business, and a ministry requires that you learn your people, your spouse, your children. You learn yourself. And then you figure out how to put it all together. And here's the thing. If a husband and a wife are struggling with each other. Don't try to fix this. But get closer to God. And what happens, you form a triangle this way, the bottom line. And the closer you get to God, the closer you get to each other. This is true in the ministry. I'm trying to get my youth over here together. I'm trying to get the children's church together. I'm trying to get the young couples together. I'm trying to get the blended families together. You can go crazy trying to fix all of that stuff. I'm serious. But if everybody in here, or anywhere in the, calls themselves a Christian, would get close to God, you fix all these problems. It got real quiet on that, didn't it? But I'm talking to you folks. Yeah, you're right. So. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. If yeah, somebody was saying, God doing this to me, so I want God to do that to all of us. Okay. I didn't plan to get emotional. I was going to go right in here and be a fireball evangelist, you know, but no, it's not going to happen. The thing that I find is this. The four spirits of revival start with repentance. And as I turn away from what I was doing to what I need to be doing, restoration begins. Whether you're a student at Teen Challenge or a brand new Christian or you're taking on a new ministry and you know there's some changes that need to be made, make the change and watch God begin to build your marriage, build your family, build your ministry, build your church, whatever it may be. And Harvey will follow that. I mean, it's a natural thing. You don't... My wife has taken some of Cody Joplin's dirt and put some seeds in it. I still have in my guest study over here 
a piece of cloth that has changed rocks in it. He took his rocks out of his dirt and put them on the altar. That means something to me. And I pray over your rocks. You're a winner. You're just beginning. Amen. Go in. Hallelujah. But the thing I want you to recognize is this. My wife doesn't stand there and look at that dirt with the seeds in it and say, grow, grow. Uh, uh, come on, get up, get up, grow. No. No. It's a natural thing. That's the way it's supposed to work. Just keep watering it. And keep watering it. And the sunlight of glory will shine on it. And it'll do what it's supposed to do. It'll do what God designed it to do. So are you. You are in good soil. Your heart is in good soil. Your heart is good soil. Watch the sunlight of glory shine on you. The washing of the water of the word is going to bring it forth. And you're going to bear a harvest. The church is going to bear a harvest. The youth group, the children's ministry, and any other ministries you're involved in in this church, it will be blessed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. My wife planted a lemon seed. And I'm looking at that lemon seed thinking, it's right straight out of the lemon. My mind tells me you have to let the seed dry out. And she's got a lemon tree about that big right now. It's time we stop telling God how to do his business. Some of us are dried out thinking we're going to grow again. Hello, you might better go get yourself wet and see what God's doing for you. Amen. I just threw that one in. That one's free. <laughs> All right. My closing point, I don't know if I am there or not. I'm just going to close, okay? But, oh, I know what I was going to tell you about the lemon tree. The mystery, the revelation there. That's a wonder. Hello, did you hear what I said? That is a wonder. I watched her put that seed in the dirt. And I'm thinking, and now? Just got that plant. We are going to see wonders like we've never seen before. Hallelujah. You're going to question some of them. But lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your doings and ways. Acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. Don't judge somebody else for what they think or what they're doing or why they're living. You take care of you. God will take care of you and them. It'll work. I promise you. Hallelujah. Now, here's what I've done so far. I've said that a true move of God will turn the hearts of the people. Elijah made that point. If God is God, serve him. A true move of God will turn the hearts of the people. And the people turned and said, Yahweh, God is God. The second thing I said to you is repentance and worship creates a spiritual awakening. Worship. And I shared this with you, I share it with you again. The most important part of this service is not the word that I'm preaching this morning. The most important part of this service is our worship. Give God the glory. You can say, Persia, that was a, an amazing sermon you had. Oh, get over it. I want to hear God say something like that. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's all about Him. And so I close with this. Power, wonder, and overflow follows an awakening. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about you as an individual. When you have that spiritual awakening, when all of a sudden you get something fresh from heaven, when all of a sudden you get that, the next thing that happens is you begin to experience the power of God in your life. Then you begin to see the wonders of God in your life. And then you begin to experience the overflow. God is not about to go bankrupt. God does not need Biden to raise taxes. 
God can take care of his people. We have a restaurant in town that puts some stickers in their menu. Eggs, 20 cents plus. I want you to know, my God, just supply all the eggs I need. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm asking you a question this morning. Can you believe big enough? You're involved with three things. The early church experienced power. Everybody say power. power. Everybody say experienced. experienced. What are you experiencing right now? No. Yes. The early church experienced power, and that was followed by the wonders, and that was followed by the overflow of people being born into the kingdom of God. The early church preached Jesus crucified. Everybody say preach. preach. Experience, preach. The early church demonstrated the power of the resurrection. In a little church on Pensacola Boulevard, doesn't exist anymore. It was old when I got there. But in that little church I knelt right about here. And I experienced God. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And it wasn't what I did, it's what he did. When I walked away from that altar, healed and delivered. I was a demonstration of the living word of God. Set free from bondage, healed in my body, in my mind. Three words I've given you. What was the first one? I thank you for that, that's true. But uh, on this last part, I gave you three words. I talked about the early church had experienced the power, experience. Preached Jesus crucified, demonstrated the power of the resurrection with signs and wonders. So I'm asking you this morning, what are you preaching? Your sermon doesn't have to be verbalized. The life you're living is your sermon. What are you preaching? Are you preaching Jesus? I asked you again, what are you experiencing? Or are you experiencing the power of God? And finally, I asked you, are you demonstrating the power of the resurrection? If you feel like you need to be experiencing the power of God more than you are right now, I'm going to ask you to join me in the altar. If you feel like you need to be preaching Jesus and not something else, I'm going to invite you to come to the altar. If you feel like you're not demonstrating the power of the resurrection adequately, I'm going to invite you to come. Would you stand with me all over the room? Let's sing. How sweet Lord, I want to
know 